and to look at the next 10 years and to say, who do I want to be in 10 years? And then we make that granular into how do we act, start acting towards that for the next year. Yeah. Um, so I do like planning. I feel like when I get scared of planning is when I have too, not too many ideas, but when I'm afraid of my own dreams. And when the audacity of my own dreams scare, scares me, <laughs> and it's like, if I write this down, it will happen. Mm -hmm. Because I am that committed to myself and what I want to build. Mm -hmm. um, and because I've created a life where I can be supported in any endeavor that, that I so choose. Mm -hmm. um, and that was very intentional. So when I think of a big dream, and it's like, all I have to do is write this down or like make this actionable, that can be really intimidating sometimes. Yeah. And it's like that whole conversation around uncharted territory that we had in the conversation club today. It's like sometimes our own potential can hold us back. Hi everyone, welcome to episode 11 of the Power of Why podcast. My name is Naomi Haley and today I am joined by the amazing Kamal Minhas. Super excited to have you here. I'm so happy to be here. This is you gonna be great. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> I feel like we already had a mini episode right before we clicked film. <laughs> Definitely. Um, yeah, I'm just so grateful that Kamal has, you know, decided to come and, and chat with us. Um, all about talking and sharing, you know, the stories of women of color who are doing incredible things for their community. So thank you. Thank you again. It's my pleasure. <laughs> so to dive right in, um, Kamal Minhas runs, you know, two of her dream companies, <laughs> and she is currently on a new endeavor with uh, Car Spaces, uh, where she brings together women of color um, in, and talks about wellness, talks about work, and a whole host of other things that I would love for you to delve into later. What I really love about your story is how you are really intentional about the work that you choose to to do and undertake, um, but it also comes from a lens of authenticity. And I think, you know, a lot of the times when we're driven to, to work on projects, it, all, it comes from a place of sometimes pain mm -hmm. or things that, you know, you have experienced in your most formative years. So thank you again for, for joining. And um, I'd love for you to talk about your origin story and, you know, what came before entrepreneurship. Yeah, absolutely. I think what you say there is like, what's that pain point or, or what's that experience that often entrepreneurs have that makes them want to remedy something or create a solution for something. And for me, it was often um, feeling like I didn't have a voice or like I didn't have an avenue to share the truth of my story. Mm -hmm. um, growing up as a first generation Canadian is a really unique experience. And it's one that is riddled with a lot of half-truths in the different worlds that you live in. The things that you share at home and then the things that you share at school are wildly different from one another. The What you eat for dinner mm -hmm. to what you're wearing uh, to temple on Sunday or whatever your denomination happens to be with your faith. Um, the language you speak at home versus the language you speak at school. And so I realized quickly that like my life was this kaleidoscope of things and that only certain people would really understand most of it, or it would be pockets of people who would understand little pieces of it. So I never really felt like I was seen in my whole self mm -hmm. with any particular part of my life. And so when I went to university, I went for storytelling, for journalism. I moved to Ottawa from Grand Prairie, Alberta, and I decided that I wanted to focus my life on story. And what's interesting about that is like, I won the physics award at my school and like well, potentially was going to go down the engineering route but then journalism and English and this passion for this aspect of things came up and through and because I think I was the youngest in my family my parents had less F's to give about what I did. Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> or they trusted me to make that decision at that time. So when I went into journalism they were super supportive and in Indian culture like back in India journalism and especially on screen journalists are valued in our society and it, it, in, it, in a lot of different ways and so my parents got it from the beginning which was really awesome because mm -hmm. I know for um, some people when they go into liberal arts or the art side of things it's less support from their parents if they're first gen. Sure. But fortunately my parents were really supportive but so I came to Carleton for that, studied journalism in my undergrad, realized early on I wasn't going to be a traditional journalist. 
there was too much of that entrepreneurial innovator in me, but I knew there would be a big aspect of storytelling in anything I did moving forward. Um, and once I graduated, I hit the sort of, sort of <coughs> social innovation, social enterprise scene in Canada, and I did my graduate studies in social innovation, which looks at like what makes up the social fabric of Canada, of this country, and how do we influence change so that we can progress um, policies, mainstream culture, um, and also like actual laws within our country for the advancement of all people. And it gave me this look at like the impact that individuals can have on a macro scale, mm -hmm. and how a lot of like social change actually begins with individuals. Yeah. So that reinforced my passion for storytelling. Mm -hmm. And it was around that time that I got an email in my inbox about Dreamgirl. Uh, there was a mm -hmm. Kickstarter campaign that was being run for the, f the film by my co-founder Erin, who we hadn't met at the time. And she had raised over $100,000 on Kickstarter with the help of a woman, Marie Forleo, yeah. who championed her uh, campaign and took it on and shared it, and that's how it came in my inbox. Mm -hmm. And so I reached out to Erin right away. I knew it was a project I had to be a part of. Dream Girl is a film about female entrepreneurs in and around New York City. And it was at a time in 20, I saw it in 2014, that trailer. And it was right when the burgeoning of female entrepreneurship and this conversation around women in business was really coming up. Yeah. We've had it now for like four or five years <coughs> as a dialogue, um, more in the mainstream, but back then it was very novel um, in a more mainstream kind of way. More of the statistics were coming up around how little venture capital was going into female-led businesses, how few positions of Fortune 500 companies, like there was more CEOs with the name John, John. than there were women. <laughs> yeah. um, so I, and I was starting my own company, Comedia. I was doing media consulting at the time. I was service-based at the time. Um, and I just felt alone and like I needed community. And so I thought, what better way to do that than to support this film, to support Erin, uh, and I invested financially. And then I also uh, came on board as a producer of the film and co-founder. And that began our two-year journey of getting the film funded, created, launched onto uh, Oprah's Super Soul 100 list, and also premiered at the White House. Mm -hmm. under the Obamas. So it was an incredible journey that we had. But it really came uh, when I was younger, This, this, that aspect of my career, and we can talk more about what I've done since Dream Girl uh, later, but uh, really from that sense of feeling like there were so many compartmentalized parts of me that what would it look like if we showed people in their wholeness that we often don't see in the media, those mm -hmm. stories that we don't often get to hear. Yeah. Yeah. When, okay. Was there a point where, when you talk about, I guess, identity and not being able to come as your full self in certain um, areas, whether that's in school or at home, there was always a piece missing. Was there something that happened, and if so, when, where you realized, I don't need to compartmentalize who I am um, in order to be accepted? Was there someone that you met that shifted that perspective? Um, you know, what was it? When did you realize? So in the film, one of our main characters, Clara Villarosa, who is this like 80-year-old, incredible woman entrepreneur, she says, sometimes you melt down and then you gotta melt up. And so that moment for me actually came after Dream Girl, um, where I had a massive burnout. I, I got very sick. So during the filming of Dream Girl uh, and the production, I was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer. I had two surgeries uh, to help me recover, but then I went right back to work. And during that period of time, we were in launch mode, and Erin and I never once said we should, we should delay things, or we should pause, or maybe we should pivot our, our working relationship, our, our working style. Right. I think we were so young, we were just hungry, and no one really, no adults were around to be like, hey, <laughs> you should probably like reconsider how you're doing things, and we also had so much momentum. Yeah. But that led to a lot of like suppressed uh, emotions and trauma with me, with my experience with cancer and my surgeries, which were really intense for me. Um, and then going back to work right away, there's a lot of learning that we need to do as a culture when it comes to grief and uh, recovering from trauma mm -hmm. so that we can support each other better through those experiences. And so it was during that time that I realized I couldn't bring my whole self to work even on this very inclusive feminist project, um, and that that was depleting me, and that I needed more time for myself, I needed to take more space to understand my boundaries better, and also to just get a better sense of what it means to be whole. Mm 
Mm. And so that actually was forced upon me when I got sick again in January 2017 after the film premiered, after we did a world, like a tour around the world with it. And it's what you were living in New York, right? I was in New York, yeah, so I was in Brooklyn. And then January 2017, I was hit with a neurological illness that led me to come back to Canada. Yeah. Free health care is... <laughs> I, you don't realize what I will pay my is. taxes for the rest <laughs> of my life because it saved my life. Um, and I moved back to Ottawa and that was the beginning of me having to rebuild my life in 2017 and that was about 10 months of a lot of um, work, a lot of wellness um, and just figuring out what does living a whole life look like for me now mm -hmm. in my mid-twenties that I've had to restart everything. Right. Mm -hmm. What is, what is your def and it varies from person to person, right? Yeah. What is your definition of being whole and living a full, whole life? I, my definition would be allowing ourselves to experience all of our emotions without judgment. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that for me was held in repressing so much of my, so many of my stories and beliefs about myself because they made me feel shame, yeah. or they made me feel not good enough, or they made me feel weak, um, or they made me feel like my story doesn't belong here because I never saw my stories belonging anywhere. So I held them, and I didn't know how to express them, and I didn't know how to be honest with the fact that my lived experience is so different than so many other people's lived experiences. All our lived experiences are unique, mm -hmm. but for some of us, we haven't had the time of day yeah. that other folks have. And so <clears throat> living a whole life is giving your story the time of day mm -hmm. um, and allowing it to breathe, allowing yourself to live intentionally and fully while really prioritizing your health. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we're seeing a lot of articles come out about this right now, um, about millennials and burnout and our addictions to work yep. and the hustle car culture mm -hmm. and this juxtaposition between millennials being these lazy individuals when we grew up post 9-11 in like the most um, unsettling of mm -hmm. recent economic times, right. building a career out of freelance and in the gig economy, which we actually have an article on Core Space coming out about that this week, oh. or sorry, next week. And um, yeah, it's, it's just this confluence of so many different factors that make the way that we work very um, unhealthy. Mm -hmm. And so a big part of what I think led me down into my burnout alongside illness, which could be correlated or not to my work habits, um, but is enabling young people to know that there's a different way to work and that we don't have to like bleed ourselves dry mm -hmm. in order to be seen as valuable in society, that our value is outside of our productivity. Mm -hmm. um, so living a whole life is being able to share your full story on your own terms but also being well while you do it. Mm -hmm. And this conversation about wellness and self-care, you know, I'm hearing more and more about this subject. Um, and I know with uh, Core Space, you guys are, like wellness is a, a key pillar in, in the work that you're doing. I think part of the, um, part of our negative relationship, I think, with work is that our, I mean, our understanding of success or what we believe is successful is oftentimes tied with hustle mm -hmm. and feeling like you have to outwork everyone, including yourself yesterday. Yeah. Um, that there is, and you know, part of it is also education. It's, it's knowing that there is a better way to do things and, you know, still valuing, valuing yourself as, you know, an important person on this planet while doing work that matters. Mm -hmm. You talked about, um, in your definition of being whole, um, oftentimes our stories were kind of left to the side or weren't being seen. I think representation is, is so important, and we were talking a little bit about it before recording, um, but having role models who look like you, who are doing you know incredible work, is kind of that um, you know, reaffirming feeling that even I get when I see amazing women like you and, um, you know, Michelle Obama, Oprah, who you have a photo with. <laughs> <laughs> but seeing people who look like you in positions um, of influence, in positions of um, 
their own definition of success is quite remarkable and it's very inspiring I think to, to a lot of people. Um, I will say on that is like it's hard to be the first and I think like I am not I am not qualified to talk about this as much as the Oprah's, the Michelle Obama's of the world, the the women and men who have trailblazed truly as the firsts in their areas. But even riding on the coattails of their their progress and their success, there is so much responsibility that we feel as women of color to represent each other that can at times feel cumbersome and burdensome. Like we can we can at times we can drown from the weight of that responsibility. Especially when we think of our mothers and our grandmothers and all the sacrifice and everything that came before us. So we have to establish healthy boundaries for ourselves when it comes to work yeah. and when it comes to how much of ourselves we're willing to give for mm -hmm. our bigger mission. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a way to be values aligned and aligned with the people around you so that you have healthy people around you, healthy communities around you, healthy friends, healthy family relationships, so that you are in like a state of equilibrium in your life. Like I didn't have that growing up. I grew up in an alcohol, like there was an alcoholic in my household. It was an abusive household. Um, recently I was sitting with my husband before bed and we were reading a book and I looked at him and I was like, is this what it was like for you to grow up? He's like, what do you mean? And I was like, like calm. <laughs> and like, you read books at night. And like, it was a very loving upbringing that I had, but it was chaotic. And there's a lot that my siblings and I are all working on, working through emotionally. Yeah. Um, but that is not unique to me, especially as a young woman of color. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, this goes beyond race, is like the trauma of our childhoods linger with us and they stay with us. Mm -hmm. And it's our responsibility as adults to heal that stuff because that also leads to different addictions that we take on, whether it is work, and that looks like a sexy addiction, but it's still an addiction, right. or whether it's fitness, or like you're overworking, whatever it is, you're trying to be the best, check, like check all the boxes, but there's never gonna be enough boxes to check mm -hmm. until you deal with those unresolved issues. Uh, and it's Bell Talk, like it's Can Mental I? Health Talk Day today. Yeah. I didn't say that properly. Bell Let's Talk. <laughs> Bell Let's Talk Day. <laughs> So like, let's talk about this. Like, yeah. I don't want to be riddled by my work addiction because that's what I saw. Like, my dad had no choice when he came to Canada. It was hustle or your family will not survive. Yeah. It was a survival game for sure. Exactly. Yeah, and I think um, a lot of folks who you mentioned, you know, uh, parents who came here from, from other countries with nothing, mm -hmm. oftentimes, it's interesting when I talk about to my friends the parents of you know the stories of my parents they almost in my head it's like we they had no other option but to work as hard as they could to start a family or to, to start this business or whatever it was um, but they almost look at me sideways and say you know that's rare mm. because you know in the face of difficulties and hardships you know there are there are options but in my head because I had the role models of my parents I never saw that option it was you have to keep going yeah but some people under the same circumstances can break yeah what do you think is you know at least one factor in being able to get through hardships community so when I think of my parents, my, my dad and my uncle, when they moved to Canada, decided to live together. So it was my mom, my dad, my aunt, and my uncle, these two families under one, one roof. But what that meant was that my aunt and my mom, with me and my cousins, could co-parent in a way, where my mom would take the morning shift at the hospital and my aunt would take the afternoon shift, so we'd always have a mom figure at home. Yeah. And then the dads would be working all day but then my grandma would be home. We'd have cousins around. My cousin, my eldest cousin, is 12 years older than me. Uh, often when I grew up, it was like she was in a mothering role in a lot of ways, along with my other cousin, who's 11 years older than me. Yeah. So it was this community that raised me, which at times got confusing. And in adulthood, I look back and I'm like, what, what? is this <laughs> all rooted in? Like, what are these beliefs rooted in? Yeah. But they couldn't have built what they did, and they couldn't have given me the life that I had if they were in isolation. Mm -hmm. And I think societally, we're reversing, like we were going towards a lot of individualism and isolationism, 
and what I want core space in the communities that I build and the physical spaces that I create are to be these places where we rebuild that sense of identity and community right. with one another. Mm -hmm. Maybe not based on religion now or based on necessarily culture, but based on values. When people come into core space, they're gonna know their values aligned with the people in the room. Mm -hmm. And very quickly, people are going to know that this is a place where I can level up and be with this community and we can be in this together and that I can be seen however I'm at, wherever I'm at. And we need these kind of safe spaces in our world, and mm -hmm. that's something I'm committed to helping create. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about what Core Spaces is and what you plan on doing for the next year, let's say? Yeah, so Core Spaces is, kind of, is like my life mission now. So we're an online news platform focused on work, wellness, and impact alongside a private digital community on Instagram where we host, for example, we hosted a core conversation today um, where it's our conversation club and uh, we talk about different themes monthly in our articles. So this month it was Uncharted Territory. We were launching, it's very fitting. Um, and so we dissect different aspects of what it means to face Uncharted Territory as a community. So I pulled in uh, Leah Bratwith who is, um, a yoga practitioner but also is writing a book right now and we talked about what that experience has been like for her facing uncharted territory mm -hmm. um, chatted with the audience and our members in the comments as well about that experience um, so this online community is really really for me it was like we're seeing news and it's needing to transform in terms of its business model so buzzfeed and huffington post a thousand jobs were cut last week in the media industry um, and people are like what's the future of news look like and since i started journalism school like 12 years ago and prior to that my profs told me people have always said journalism is dying journalism is not dying the business models around journalism are having to change so we are a subscription-based news model um, but I also think that adding community and collaboration to journalism is important as it evolves forward. Mm -hmm. And when I think of niche communities, especially women who we serve mostly, like we're open to all people, we're built by women, open for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, it's this focus around work, wellness, and impact that bring us all together. Mm -hmm. My audience are in hugely ambitious humans. They will go to the ends of the earth to accomplish and become who they know they're destined to become. So what I want to do is equip them with the light, like supportive lifestyle that can help them not burn out and just keep riding that wave of self motivation and like commitment to their higher purpose mm -hmm. with like minded people. Mm -hmm. So through journalism, through community, and that's what our digital aspect is about. We do monthly playlists as well, which I love. Our core vibes playlists on Spotify, and then the in in person aspect is going to be these co. And then the physical aspect is we're creating co-working community spaces, first in Ottawa, that are centered around this ethos of work, wellness, and impact. So places where we can talk business and politics, but also have wellness classes and workshops happening all in the same environment, mm -hmm. where you're gonna have breastfeeding rooms and spaces for new mothers to be able to like get out of their house and come and work on their projects that they might be working on, or just be in a different kind of space. Right. Very cozy, very much like our office vibes here. Um, opening first in Ottawa and then I'd like to expand across the country. So this is something where I want to help build a generation of people who are committed to integrating work wellness and impact in their lives mm -hmm. so that they can live healthier lives overall <coughs> and we can like get that gross domestic happiness up for Canadians. Um, I'm committed to this country and I'm committed to the people in it and I think that we are world leaders in so many ways and that as we build these smaller communities and niche communities around values. Yeah. Um, I want Core Space to be like a leader in that development. And I think, you know, one thing that I really love about this um, is that there's a different lens when it's created by women. Yes. Incorporating those spaces for breastfeeding or, you know, even meditation rooms. Um, the lens, the dialogue is going to be different. And once we, I feel, you know, start from a place where we're able to build for us, I think that's going to shift a lot of different areas in society, for mm -hmm. sure. At least creating a space where, you know, women feel comfortable to come and, and share their full selves with people who aren't going to judge them, Yeah. you know, for who they are. Yeah, and where they know that, like, if they just need to come and feel, like, I want this space to be like a metaphorical warm hug. Mm. and where people can just come when they need some reprieve or like they just need to get out of their house 
just need somewhere else to go. Right. If it's work related, excellent. Like it's going to be a co work space. That's going to be the ethos of the space. Mm -hmm. But community is equally as important. Mm -hmm. So I remember growing up and going to the temple and like Sunday school and going and learning Punjabi and doing all of these things and had such like a tight knit community through my faith. Well, we're growing up now in a space where people aren't as committed to their faith, but they still need connection to one another. Yeah. So that's what this is going to create. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you have a responsibility to do, like where does your drive come from? Mm -hmm. um, do you feel, earlier you mentioned the word, you know, burdensome. Do you, um, do you sometimes try to turn that on its head and allow it to come from a really positive space to drive you? Oh, for sure, but I think that it's like, it's different language for the same thing. You can say burden and you can say responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, you can say like this this lights me up and or like this is like cumbersome but I have to do it, you right. know? It's all about perspective. Mm -hmm. And so not getting thrown off by your changing perspective every day. Uh, when I was sick and went in recovery, like I, I really hit my rock bottom and it was like there was no light in my future. I didn't know if I would be able to work again. I didn't know if my brain would function properly again. It was a real moment for me of clarity of like, if my life is no longer related to my intellect and my mm -hmm. capacity of using my mind, yeah. then what's the quality of life that I want to have? And so that's where I really focused on the relationships with the people around me, with the community around me, um, with my physical space, with nature, reconnecting with nature. All these things kind of helped me rebuild myself. And that that slow and steady like rebuilding of myself allowed me the opportunity because we have to remember that not everyone gets to work not everyone gets to live a full and complete life not everyone is able-bodied and not everyone is given the gifts that i have been given in this life mm -hmm. and so yes there's like huge responsibility with that but when i was in the thick of my dark time that is what motivates me, is looking back and saying there was a point in my life where I didn't, I had no self-love, self-value, awareness of what I was still capable of. Mm -hmm. Now I do. And it drives me every day to just know that I have a second chance at all of this. Yeah. So like, what else would I spend my time doing? <laughs> What else would what I else do? can you spend your time doing? Other like, than like building dope shit for dope people. <laughs> like that is my fuel. Yeah. And you know, I come from a great place of privilege in saying this because I have been supported by my parents. Like my parents came, the, I, the story is always like with $12 in my pocket, all of that, worked at a pulp mill in Northern Alberta, saved up their money, built their first business around law calling and went from there, but I was never allowed to have a job in school. My parents wouldn't let me, they said education first. Yeah. And I got a secret job on the side, working at the concession at the hockey arena because I just wanted to work. Um, and I was saving up to go on a trip, school trip to Europe, and I didn't want to ask my parents for the money, even though they would have supported me to go. Right. And on the last day of that job, my dad picked me up before this trip, and he was like, You're, you have to quit now. And so that's when I started putting all my time and energy into nonprofit work and fundraising and community building. But that's a privilege that I didn't have to work mm -hmm. throughout high school, uh, into university. My tuition was always paid. And for me in my professional life, when an investment opportunity came up in a new industry in Canada, I could borrow money from my dad to make my first major investment that then subsequently went on to IPO and has g gave me the freedom to take the year off that I needed to. Yeah. Privilege, mm -hmm. like ultimate privilege. Like I'm the first to say the way that I was able to set time aside to recover, like I've been through a lot, but I had the golden ticket of life mm -hmm. in a loving family and in the financial support that I had and now the financial like future that I build for myself. Mm -hmm. So knowing that side of it too, it's like I'm putting my money where my values are. Yeah. And I'm gonna invest in spaces where I can make safe havens for people, where I can like invest my money into helping other people feel safe and secure and valued in themselves and their work. Mm -hmm. um, because what else would I do? <laughs> like I just That's a perfect why not? <laughs> yeah, no, and that is honestly um, I love that answer because it's your truth mm -hmm. and oftentimes you know when people ask me about where my drive comes from 
it's almost well for me it's inexplicable like there is no other thing that I would rather be doing especially with the undertones of knowing where my parents came from and what their story was mm -hmm. responsibility is a beautiful thing when you can look at it from a different and really blessed perspective mm -hmm. um, you talked about support network and how important community and your family and friends are Every single episode of the Power of Why podcast, you know, my guest has always talked about support network mm -hmm. and how this has been the reason why they were able to get through, you know, whatever hurdles or obstacles came through their way. Mm -hmm. um, how do you nurture your, your support network? So growing up, like, relationship is hard. Being in relationship with people can be very difficult. I am blessed that, like, my... I hate using this term, and I'm gonna need my ride or die ladies. <laughs> <laughs> they, are, they were my bridesmaids. I know that, like, for some of them, we haven't chatted in weeks, sometimes mm -hmm. months, but we can just pick up mm -hmm. and talk to each other. And you know what that's rooted in is truth and loyalty and authenticity with one another. I'm not here to burn anyone ever. It is never my intention to harm. And I think questioning the intention of your actions. And if you're gonna hurt someone, asking yourself why you're hurting that person and coming clean with yourself. Because I think where a lot of people like fall off is when they haven't been true with their intentions or when they are being malicious in their intent with a person and then a relationship falls apart. I've had that happen. There are people I was very close with who I'm not close with anymore and it needed to happen. But you know how those memes go around where it's like, someone's like negative in your life, cut them. <laughs> That's lazy. You have to do the work to maintain relationships a lot of the time. Like, what am I gonna do? Cut like half my family? No, in some cases, yes. If it's like, if it's beyond negligence, if it's like violent and completely unhealthy in nature. But a lot of the times we cop out on the emotional labor that we have to do to maintain healthy relationships. Yeah. And we need to hear that and we need to be reminded of that. I've had to put so much work in the last three years to heal relationships in my life because I value them. And I had to like wake up to the fact that I value them. And so community and like I have the best community I could ever fathom. But it's because I am intentional with the people in my life every single day. I value love. I value honesty. I value truth. I don't hold back on love. I will give love. Like it is an infinite resource in me. And sometimes we grow up thinking love is a scarce resource. It's not. Mm -hmm. The more you give it, honestly, the more it will come back to you. And I'm a that. living example of that. Mm -hmm. And so the more love I can give, the better off I will be, but also the better off my relationships will be. Mm -hmm. Can we shift a little bit and yeah. talk about risk taking? Yes. Especially, and you have you know a lot of different avenues to pull from with regards to risk taking. You know, one could be the dream girl project that you were working on, but maybe highlight, um, you know, one risk that you took that really paid off, maybe one that didn't, and what you learned from both. Yeah. Um, Dream Girl was a huge risk, and it paid off and it didn't. Um, so it paid off in, like, the in social impact that we had through the film, the audiences, like tens of thousands of people who have watched this film, yeah. and who continue to on YouTube. Um, because the film is now on YouTube for free. Shameless plug. Check it out. <laughs> <laughs> Links to everything will be yeah. on the show notes. Dream Girl film <laughs> on YouTube. Dream Girl documentary. Um, but then as financially, it wasn't a success. So I invested a significant amount of money in, we had our Kickstarter campaign, and we had uh, angel investment funding come in. Films are expensive, and we had plans to make our own distribution company and distribute the film on our own. and. We did that, but we also did it at a time when I was coming through my cancer surgeries. I was supposed to be the lead on distribution. Erin had to step in and take over distribution after she had just finished directing and editing an entire film. Like, it was chaos, mm -hmm. but we just kept believing in it. And for those past, last like six to eight months, it took a lot more uh, investment than it was earning back. And so, if you're looking at it from a completely financial standpoint, it wasn't a total failure, but it was a risk that didn't make the return that we expected on the financial side. Mm -hmm. However, it was a risk that took off on 
changing the world. <laughs> there was a movement behind Dream Girl, and that's where like sometimes, and I talked to my dad about it after the fact, and he was like, I was certain it wasn't going to be a financial success, but it has changed your life and the lives of others, mm -hmm. and that's how I know that it was a success in the broader form of the world. So this is where our definitions of success also come in. But that money narrative stayed with me for a while around like, am I choosing the right investments? Am I making the right calls here? Um, but in the end, it's like, it, it was one of the best investments I ever made. Mm -hmm. Maybe not for financial return, but for impact return. Mm -hmm. um, and also for building up our personal brands. Like, I wouldn't be here, we probably wouldn't be chatting had I not built Dream Girl with Aaron, and had we not taken the risk on each other and making that film. But the yeah, stories can be messy. Mm -hmm. And so it was both like a, a risk that showed great return, but also great loss. Mm -hmm. That's the thing about uh, money that I find interesting. Like, it will it will flow, I think, freely if our minds are aligned mm -hmm. to that in a, in a certain perspective. Um, but we can always make more money. Like, yes. it's not... It's not a finite resource. Exactly. We released an article last week about manifesting money and the conversations and how, like, the abundance mindset yes. and, like, the power of attraction conversations yeah are valid to a point, but then you add in the complexity of like systemic poverty and racial discrimination and all of these things. Mm -hmm. Those are, my experience with money is that it flows. Like I have made almost 100x on an IPO investment. Um, and now I'm reinvesting that money into businesses that I believe in, founders that I believe in, initiatives that I believe in, because that's how I believe I'll make more money. Exactly. When I look at core space, our our subscriptions are seven ninety nine and seventy nine ninety nine. So seven ninety nine a month or eighty dollars for the year. Mm -hmm. That's a really small product for us to be launching. Yeah. And so as I'm looking at our revenue models and looking at the profitability of this, it's a longer term play for the digital magazine. Sure. Um, it's hot. It's it's high risk in some ways in terms of like the scale with like my personal assets and the business assets and everything. It's something that excites me and I'm excited to invest in, but it's gonna be a while before we see the financial return on this until we open the co-work space, until I'm public speaking more and sharing the message, until we're building up our main subscriber base. Mm -hmm. But that first thousand is gonna be really difficult for us. Mm -hmm. And with any brand, those first, like building that critical mass is always really difficult. But you put in the work and hopefully it'll happen. Mm -hmm. um, and if it doesn't, you find other ways to make sure that it's a rewarding experience and that you're going to benefit from it. I'm really excited to see the work that you that you have coming with regards to this and, and building a platform that you can grow so many different um, things from. Yeah, Because mm -hmm. oftentimes when you're sitting here and thinking, okay, this is kind of what I want to do in the next year, anything can happen. Yeah. You can meet that person that says, oh my god, you should try this. And that can turn into an avenue for for further discovery. Mm -hmm. did, did you ever see, like, if you look back, like, even five years, um, five years prior, did you see this life that you have built for yourself? Five years ago, it would be before Dream Girl even came into my life. Yeah. So, I was finishing my grad program at Waterloo in social innovation, and I was looking for what the next right step was going to be. And at the time, I was it was prior to the election in 2014, 2015, because the elections this year, yeah, four years. I was thinking I was going to run in politics. I was thinking I was going to run in our riding in Alberta. There was some gerrymandering that happened, so they split our riding into two in Grand Prairie. Um, and that was that was what I thought I was going to do five years ago. Wow. And Dream Girl came along, and I think it worked out for the best. I think, you know, it was a red wave back in uh, 2015, and we had a lot of younger politicians coming in. Um, but at the same time, when I do choose to go into politics eventually, I want it to be with a lot more experience and life behind me, um, with a lot more to give to this country. Um, but five years ago, looking forward, would I have thought I would end up right here? I wouldn't have not thought it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it doesn't, it doesn't, I don't think I would be totally surprised by it, but I'd yeah. be like, holy shit, a lot happened in five years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you like to plan? Are you a planner? I'm a planner. Mm -hmm. Well, we released a planner with, with Core Space, 
called Your Integrated Life, and it was like a, uh, it's a new year planner. You can still use it if you're looking, you can find it online. Um, and it looked at work wellness and impact as pillars of our lives, a reflection on how far we've come in those areas, like ways to give ourselves high fives, mm -hmm. um, and then to look at the next 10 years and to say, who do I want to be in 10 years? And then we make that granular into how do we act, st start acting towards that for the next year. Yeah. Um, so I do like planning. I feel like when I get scared of planning is when I have too, not too many ideas, but when I'm afraid of my own dreams. And when the audacity of my own dreams scare, scares me. <laughs> and it's like, if I write this down, it will happen. Mm -hmm. Because I am that committed to myself and what I want to build. Mm -hmm. um, and because I've created a life where I can be supported in any endeavor th that I so choose. Mm -hmm. um, and that was very intentional. So when I think of a big dream, and it's like, all I have to do is write this down or like make this actionable, that can be really intimidating sometimes. Yeah. And it's like that whole conversation around uncharted territory that we had in the conversation club today, it's like sometimes our own potential can hold us back. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like the Marian Williams. Sometimes we, we don't wanna write down our, or for me I get overwhelmed by like writing out and planning everything because sometimes the dreams can be feel so big. Mm -hmm. um, or like, it's like, but can I really make this happen? It's like when I write it down, it's like, yes, you're gonna make this thing happen. Um, so the quote that I was thinking about was Marianne Williamson, uh, which Nelson Mandela also quoted, mm -hmm. our greatest fear is not that we're inadequate, but our greatest fear is that we're powerful beyond measure. Um, because often we can be our own biggest critics and get in our own way yeah. about outcomes and, and who we are and what we can accomplish in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so just supporting ourselves and being surrounded by good people who remind us of our capacity and encourage us to get those plans written down. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. And writing it down in a clear way, someone said to me, it's already done. Like yeah. as soon as you make that decision that you're going to move forward with this course of action, it's already done. Yeah. You just have to go do the work. It's already happened. I really love that. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences. Thank you. And the last question that we have on the power of why is, what's your why? Mm -hmm. And what do you feel that you were meant to do during your time here? My why what my Instagram caption is. Which I love, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> well, I just like, every time I thought of something, no, I was like, this is the thing, is I create and fund work I wish existed when I was younger. Yeah. So anything that I put my time, effort, energy, money into are products and services and businesses that I could benefit from now and at a younger age and likely well into my future. Mm -hmm. But just to en help enable this next generation to have Meet, to see themselves as the protagonists of the stories they're taking in, but also of the lives they're seeing other people live. Mm -hmm. So they can put themselves in that person's shoes because they look like them, they sound like them, they have similar life experiences as them. And there's a lot of underrepresented people who don't haven't had that opportunity yet. And are only now, like, when we're looking at, like, Crazy Rich Asians and Black Panther and the fact that, fact that Black Panther got the top award at the SAG Awards, yeah. and, like, that could put it as a front runner as Best Picture at the Oscars, it's like, these are, we're changing the very fabric of the societies within which we live. Mm -hmm. And I want to be a part of that larger shift and change so that more people feel seen, more people s can fulfill their potential. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Love to end on that note. Thank you so much for watching this episode of the Power of Why podcast. We'll see you in the next one. Ciao. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the Power of Why podcast. It is such a pleasure to bring forward women who are absolutely killing it in their industry. If anything resonated with you in this episode, make sure to put it in the comments or even reach out to me directly. So if you know any woman or if you are a woman who um, is doing incredible things in your community, send me a message. I'd love to chat.